Welcome everybody to another session of Advanced Accounting. Uh, we are now tackling Chapter 5, uh, where we continue on with our consolidated financial statements. Um, this time, we're going to go a little bit in detail on the intercompany transactions that are related to inventories. And Chapter 6 will be for fixed assets. So let's get started. Our objectives for this lesson is to understand the impact of intercompany profit and inventories on preparing consolidation work papers, apply the concepts of upstream versus downstream inventory transfers, defer unrealized inventory profits remaining in the ending inventory, recognize realized previously deferred inventory profits in the beginning inventory, and adjust non-controlling interest amounts in the presence of intercompany inventory profits. So once again, the purpose of, of the eliminating entries when preparing consolidated financial statements is to present um, a set of financial statements where the intercompany transactions between parent and subsidiary are erased uh, as if they have never taken place. The reason for that is when we consolidate our financial statements, it would be like selling to ourselves, buying from ourselves, or transacting with the same company. But as we said, the parent and subsidiary usually exist on their own and they prepare their own financial statements. They have their own accounting systems. Uh, so when we consolidate them, then we have to get rid of redundancies. So we're still applying the same concept uh, in terms of inventories. So there are some rules that we need to observe in terms of intercompany sales of inventory in accordance to a gap. Um, the first one is that when we have a sale from parent to subsidiary or subsidiary to parent of inventory, we are not going to recognize the gain on that sale until either the parent or the subsidiary sells the item the inventory to a third party, an outsider. Uh, the reason for that is to limit manipulation of the financial statements. If we were going to recognize all gains between parents and subsidiary, then they could um, engage in um, trying to manipulate the financial statements to make the financial statements look good. So in order to do that, um, GAP and the FASB have decided to recognize the gain only when the sales are to outsiders. Uh, so in the meantime, for any inventory that remains with either the parent or the subsidiary, we are going to defer that gain and we'll explain that a little bit further in a few more slides. Um, our assumption here for this purpose is that uh, we're using uh, first in, first out to account for our inventory, which means that the inventory at the beginning or our beginning inventory, we're assuming that it will be sold. Um, and the ending inventory comes from current uh, sales. So here's an example. Um, during 2012, PET sold goods costing $1,000 to a subsidiary at a gross profit of 30%. SIM had none of this inventory on hand at the end of 2012. So in this case, we have, first of all, what we need to observe is what kind of cell do we have? Do we have a downstream sale or upstream sale. Downstream sale is when the sale is from the parent, in this case is pet, to SIM. So this sale that we are um, 
we have here is downstream. If the cell was from sim to pet, then that cell would be upstream. So from the sub to the parent is upstream, from the parent to the sub is downstream. And I added a calculation for gross profit. Um, so sometimes your problem will give you a markup or a gross profit. So in this case, they've given us a gross profit. And if we recall, gross profit is, um, the gross profit percentage is calculated by uh, taking the gross profit divided by sales. So, and the way to calculate gross profit is we take our sales, less our cost of sales, and that equals our gross profit. So that's how we have calculated or they have calculated the 30%. Now the problem only give us the cost of the item. It didn't give us the sales price of the item. So in order to calculate the sales price, we take the cost of $1,000 divided by 70% or one minus the gross profit of 30%. So we have to pay attention to that when we're looking at these problems. First of all, are we giving the sales price or are we giving the cost? And do we have a markup or do we have a gross profit? Because the calculation will differ if it's a markup. The other item that we need to check is um, that SIM has no inventory on hand at the end of the year. So if SIM had inventory on hand at the end of the year, we would have to defer the amount of gain related to that inventory on hand. But in this case, we have no deferral because SIM has no inventory on hand, meaning the SIM has sold all of the goods that they purchased from PET, the parent, to a third party. And we said, as long as they sell it to a third party, we're going to recognize the gain. So in the parents' books, which are shown on the left side of your slide, we have what the parent would have booked for this sale. We have uh, cash, let's assume it was cash, it could be accounts receivable, a credit to sales for the sales price, and then we have um, a debit to cost of sales and a credit to inventory. So we're assuming a perpetual inventory system. Uh, so remember that every time that we sell inventory, we have two journal entries, right? One to record the sale and the second journal entry to record the cost of sales and get rid of the inventory or reduce our inventory balance. On Sims books, we're going to debit the inventory and <clears throat> I'm sorry, we're going to credit cash or accounts payable. That's when we purchase the inventory from our parent. When we sell it to an outside party, we are going to have, of course, the cash and the sales, but we're also gonna have the cost of sales and the inventory. So I posted these here so that you can see um, how would each entity treat this transaction on their own books, because that might make sense as to the eliminating entry. So our eliminating entry um, for PET and SIM would be to debit the sale, because remember, we're trying to reverse the transaction. We're trying to show us if the sale has never taken place. So we have to debit sales in order to get rid of the credit to sales that was done by PET. And we have to credit cost of sales for um, SIM's entry of cost of sales. Uh, so in order to eliminate that entry, we need to debit sales and credit cost of sales for 1,429. So we're here using the sales price, not the cost. So here we have another example between PAL and SAL. So this again is a downstream sale. Um, in this case, we don't have to pay attention to the 2011 facts because we're preparing 2012, one. And two is that Sal at the end of 2011 did not have any inventory on hand. All inventory was sold. So we have 
uh, recognize all the profit on that inventory. So we don't have to worry about 2011. In 2012, again, we have a downstream sale between PAL and SAL, and we have a gross profit of 40%. In this case, SAL, the subsidiary, still has goods on hand of $200. So we know that every time that we see that there's inventory left at the end of the year, we are going to have to defer the profit, only the profit on that inventory that remains. So the first step is that we need to calculate the sales price in this case because we were given cost and gross profit. So we can do that. Uh, we take our cost divided by 60% or one minus the 40%. So the sales price of this inventory was 1500. So we have to eliminate the sales. So we're going to debit sales and credit cost of sales for 1500. The next step is to defer the profit on the 200. So we take our 200 times the 40%, uh, which equals $80. In order to uh, defer the profit, we're going to debit cost of sales. The reason for debiting cost of sales is because if we increase cost of sales, which is an expense, we're going to decrease net income, therefore not recognizing the gain of $80. Okay, here in this example, we have a beginning inventory, and we have an ending inventory. So last year, again, once again, we're preparing 2012. So last year, 2011, Pam sold goods costing 300 to its, its subsidiary, SIR, at a markup of 25%. So note that we don't have gross profit. This time we have a markup of 25%. So the calculation is going to differ slightly. SIR had 120 of this inventory on hand at the end of 2011. So unlike our previous slide, the subsidiary still has inventory left at the end of the prior year. So this ending inventory at the end of 2011 will be the beginning inventory in 2012. During 2012, Pam sold additional goods costing 500 to SIR at a 30% markup. SIR has 260 of these goods at hand on um, 2012. So we have beginning inventory in 2012 of 120 that was left um, unsold last year, and we have 260 in our ending inventory of the subsidiary um, that was uh, not sold to a third party in 2012. So from the previous slide, we know that um, SIRS 260 of goods on hand at the end of 2012, we're going to have to defer the profit on uh, these goods. So let's go ahead and do the, um, the two entries that we're familiar with from the previous slide. So the first thing that we need to do is to calculate the sales price because it wasn't given. We were given the cost and a markup. With the markup, um, you could do it the way that is shown on the slide, or you can take the 500 times 1.3, uh, and that should give you the same result. So a little bit of a shortcut, um, might be quicker on uh, doing your calculations, but either way it should give you the same res result. So we have to eliminate the sale for 650. So we debit sale for 650 and we credit cost of sales. Our second entry is to defer the profit on the ending inventory of 260. So uh, we take our 260 times 30% divided by 130%. And that will give us our profit on this um, inventory on hand at the end of the year. So we know that we have to debit cost of sales because if we increase cost of sales, that would decrease net income, therefore deferring the profit. And we credit inventory for $60.
The third entry pertains to the beginning inventory. So we are assuming that um, the inventory that's deferred in one year, the profit will be recognized in the following year. So in 2011, we would have um, the same entry as we do now with the $60, except with it was the 24. So we, de we actually deferred this profit on the $120 in 2011. We don't have to defer it again in 2012. Now in 2012, we're assuming that we, are, we have sold it or Sir has sold it to an outside party. So we are recognizing the gain. In order to recognize the gain for the beginning inventory, we are going to credit cost of sales. So if we reduce our cost of sales, we're going to increase net income, therefore recognizing the profit. And the account that we're gonna debit is our investment in uh, SER or subsidiary. And how we calculated the 24 is the 120 times 25% divided by 125%. We're using the markup from 2011. So these are the basic three eliminating entries that relate to inventory. The first entry was to eliminate the sales. The second entry was to defer the gain from the ending inventory. And the third entry was to recognize the gain from the prior year, from the beginning inventory. So here we have an illustration of downstream and upstream sales. So downstream is a sale from parent to subsidiary, which are the examples that we've seen up until now. And the upstream sales are from subsidiary to parent. This is not going to affect the deferred profit or recognition of profit. What is going to have an effect on is the non-controlling interest. This is a template of the eliminating entries related to intercompany profits for downstream sales. So the first entry is our debit to sales to eliminate the sales. The second entry is to defer the gross, the profit on inventory, ending inventory. And the third entry is to uh, recognize um, the inventory profit from beginning inventory. Note, that when we have an upstream sales, um, there's going to be, we're going for the third entry, we're going to split the realized profit between the controlling interest and the non-controlling interest. So pay attention to that as we cover downstream sales and upstream sales. So this is from um, just a summary of the previous example. So here's a graphical representation of the downstream cell. And um, how are we going to split the income recognized between the controlling interest and the non-controlling interest. So we have the subsidiary income, uh, net income is 5,200. That's from the previous slide. The current amortization was 450, also from previous slide. So our adjusted income for this subsidiary is 4,750. Before the um, deferred profits on ending inventory and the recognized profits from the beginning inventory. So the 4,750 times 
um, is recognized by the controlling interest and 20% by the non-controlling interest. Then the deferred profits on ending inventory and the recognition of profits on beginning inventory are only allocated to the parent. The reason for that is because this is a downstream sale. So since it's a downstream sale, those deferred profits and recognition of profits are related 100% or directly to the parent. None is allocated to the non-controlling interest. So the income from subsidiary that will be recognized by the parent will be $3,764. On an upstream sale, upstream sale is from subsidiary to parent. We have the same figures, except that uh, now the deferred profits on ending inventory and recognition of profits on beginning inventory is split, is shared by the controlling interest and the non-controlling interest based on their ownership percentages. So 60, which is the deferred profits on ending inventory times 80% is 48 and times 20% is 12 and so on with the 24 as well. In this case, we could have taken the income recognized of 4,714 times 80% and times 20% and arrived at the same results as we see here for income from subsidiary recognized by the controlling interest of 3,771.20 and $942.80. And In this example, we have how almost 90% of sale acquired at book value, no amortizations. During the current year, sale reported 10,000 of income. Pal sold goods to sell during the year for 15,000, including a profit of 6,250. Sal still holds 40% of these goods at the end of the year. So we know that this is going to, or this is a downstream sale from PAL to SAL. We also know that um, at the end of the year, SAL still holds 40% of the goods. We know that the total gross uh, profit on the inventory that was sold to SAL is 15,000. The profit is 6,250. So 40% of the 6,250 is the amount that needs to be deferred um, until the inventory is sold to a third party. So that amount is 2,500. So we're going to calculate PALS income by taking 90% of the subsidiary's income, which is 10,000. And we are going to subtract the unrealized or deferred profits to arrive at the income from SAL that will be recognized by PAL. For the non-controlling interest share, we simply take 10% of the 10,000 income, the subsidiary's net income. And we notice that we are not deducting the deferred profit from the non-controlling interest share because it's a downstream sale. So the deferred profit is allocated to the parent. Next we have PAL's journal entry to record the income. Now remember that PAL is going to use uh, or continues to use the equity method. So just like any other entry under the equity method when recognizing the subsidiary's net income, we're going to debit investment and sell for 6500 and income from sale for 6,500. The eliminating entries related to the sale is, first of all, we have to reverse the sale. So we debit sales and credit cost to goods sold for 15,000, which is the sales price. Um, and then we're going to defer 
the profit on the inventory that remains on hand. Uh, so in order to do that, we're going to debit cost of goods sold and credit inventory. Here we have the worksheet uh, for the income statement. So we can see the eliminating interest reflected on the debits and credits of, the, um, of this worksheet in arriving at the consolidated totals. So um, we have that um, the 15,000 uh, of sales is being reversed. So sales is being reduced by the 15,000 and cost of sales is reduced by 15,000. We completely eliminated the income from sale for uh, 6,500. So we can see under the consolidated totals that the balance for the income from sub is zero. And we have our non-controlling interest share of the consolidated net income, which is 1,000. Once again, we have a graphic illustration of the downstream sale. So we have the 10,000 from the subsidiary net income, and 90% of that is allocated to the controlling interest, 10% of that to the non-controlling interest. And the deferred profit on ending inventory is allocated entirely to the controlling interest because this is downstream sale. If we had um, to recognize profits in beginning inventory, those would also be allocated um, all to the controlling interest and none to the non-controlling interest. In this slide, we show the upstream sale. So assuming the same facts, except that Sal sells goods to PAL we still have the same amount of unrealized profits or deferred profits in ending inventory. But note that PAL's income is um, reduced by the 2,500 and also the non-controlling interest is reduced by the 2,500. Once we get the net amount, then we multiply it by their ownership percentages to arrive at the income from the subsidiary that will be allocated to each. This is an illustration of the allocation. So once again, we have our subsidiary net income of 10,000, 90% allocated to the controlling interest and 10% allocated to the non-controlling interest. But the 2,500 in deferred profits in ending inventory, it's being also allocated 90 and 10 respectively. This is different from the previous slide when it was downstream, where we're only allocated the deferred profits to the parent. Here we are allocating the deferred profits and if we had to recognize profits from beginning inventory, it would be the same. We would have to allocate it based on their ownership percentages. So here we have a comprehensive example. Perry acquires 70% of salt at the beginning of 2011 for 420 when salt's equity consisted of 200 capital stock and 200 retained earnings. Sal's inventory was understated by 50 and building with a 20 year life was understated by 100. Any excess is considered goodwill. If you check my notes for this slide, um, you'll see my calculation of the allocation, which is a step two and three, and the amount allocated to goodwill after we have uh, identified the amounts allocated to the understated inventory and building, and the respective amortization calculation for the building. 
So check the notes. We're also given information on the income from the parent and the subsidiary and dividends. Now we know that the parent's income and the dividends from the parent are also irrelevant. So we could disregard that information and only consider Salt's information. During 2011, Salt sold goods for 700 to Perry at a 20% markup. So note here that we're using markup instead of gross profit. 240 of these goods were in Perry's ending inventory. In 2012, Salt sold goods for 900 to Perry at a 25% markup, and Perry still had 100 on hand at the end of the year. So let's analyze these two intercompany transactions. During 2011, Salt sold goods to Perry. So that is an upstream sale. 240 of these goods remains in ending inventory of 2011, which is the beginning inventory of 2012. So we know that the assumption is that the inventory last year will be or would have been sold to a third party in the current year. So we're going to have to recognize profit on the 240. In 2012, Salt uh, sold goods to Perry, so Perry still had on hand 100 of inventory at the end of the year. So this inventory is the ending inventory, so we mean, it means that we have to go defer the profit on the $100 in the current year. So if we look at the, the graphic illustration of this transaction for 2011, remember we have two years. So for 2011, Sol's net income was 705. We subtract the amortization for the building and the adjusted income in, and I'm sorry, for the building and the inventory. And the adjusted income is now 650. Since this is upstream, the deferred profits on the ending inventory will have to be allocated based on their ownership percentages accordingly. Note that we are also um, have dividends in this problem. So the dividends are being allocated based on ownership percentages as well. So 70% to the controlling interest and 30% to the non-controlling interest. Now we know that dividends, um, just as a refresher, we're going to debit cash and credit the investment in SALT. The dividends on a consolidated basis will have to be eliminated. So here we have the parents. Um, entries in the parents' books, not on a consolidated basis. These are not eliminating entries. Uh, these are the same entries that we had in Chapter 2. I'm sorry, Chapter 3. Uh, so we debit the investment in sold at the acquisition uh, credit cash, assuming that we pay cash. Uh, we have the um, dividends, so we're going to debit cash and credit investment in SALT for 70% of the dividends in 2011. And then we're going to record the share of our income, the 70% of SALT's in, uh, income uh, that comes from the uh, previous slide of 427. So we're going to debit investment in SALT and credit income from SALT. So in this slide, we have the eliminating entries. So we're going to debit sales, as always, and credit cost of sales for the sales price in 2011. We are going to defer the profit on the ending inventory in 2011. And we're also going to eliminate sales, um, 
income uh, and sold uh, dividends, the controlling interest share of those dividends, which were shown on the previous um, slide, the graphic representation. Uh, in C, we are also um, eliminating the non-controlling share of the dividends, uh, the non-controlling um, interest uh, share or income share um, as shown in the previous slide. And in D, this should be an entry that is familiar to you already, which is the eliminating entry of the subsidiary stock uh, or equity. And the um, adjustment of the inventory and building and goodwill as a result of the acquisition, because remember that 2011 was the year of acquisition. And then we credit investment and salt and the non-controlling interest. So finally, if we were going to plug all these eliminating entries in our consolidation uh, worksheet, this would be the end result. So we can see that our income from salt is zero on a consolidated basis. Uh, we can see also on the income statement portion, which is the upper part of the worksheet, that we have a non-controlling interest share of 183. We have our consolidated net income of which 183 belongs to non-controlling uh, interest and the 1,305 to the controlling interest. Also observe that retained earnings, the beginning retained earnings is the one that is being eliminated. So the result is the parents uh, beginning retained earnings remains in the consolidated financial statements. For the balance sheet part, we can see that our investment in salt is now zero. Uh, we have added our goodwill and we have our non-controlling interest of 279. Now we have a graphical representation of 2012 activity. We have SALT's net income of 745, less the amortization. We only have the building because the inventory was fully amortized in 2011. And then we have deferred profits in ending inventory for 2012 and realized profits from beginning inventory 2011. Since this is an upstream sale, the deferred profit and the realized profit are being allocated to the controlling interest and non-controlling interest based on their percentages of ownership. So the income from salt that the controlling interest recognizes is 532, and this is the one that's going to be eliminated in the consolidation entry. Um, I'm sorry, in the consolidated uh, financial statements through the eliminating entries. We also have our subsidiary dividends, and these are being allocated based on their respective percentages, which will also have to be eliminated. So once again, these are the parents entries on the, in the parents books. So we have the cash and the investment in salt for the dividends that were received and also recording the income from salt of 532. Our investment in salt, the balance in the balance sheet would be 973. This is Perry's books, not the consolidated. Remember that we still have an upstream sale in 2012. So note how these um, entries vary between the downstream and upstream. So the first two entries will pretty much be the same for upstream and downstream. The only one that changes is the third entry because for the upstream, we have to include the non-controlling interest. So the first entry eliminates the sales for 2012. The second entry recognizes or defers the profit from uh, 2012 ending inventory. 
And the third entry is the recognition from the beginning inventory. So um, the amount is 40, and that's being split 70-30 between the controlling interest and the non-controlling interest. So this ends our presentation for this week. You are required to post these eliminating entries for the last three slides into the template worksheet that was provided with uh, the assignment for the week. Uh, so please um, go ahead and try to input these and uh, see if you can zero out the income in sub from the income statement and also um, zero out the investment in sub on the balance sheet. So those should be um, good check figures on what your consolidation final numbers should be. And as always, if you have any questions, don't hesitate to send me an email or use the um, course Q&A or any other forum in Moodle to communicate.